And it's News 360. It's live on news up here at Desawe in Kanda. My name is Alfred Okansi. And I'm Natalie Ford. So look at the top stories this evening. Former appointees of the Maham administration accused of taking double salary being investigated for stealing. Uh, the Ghana Physicians Assist Assistance Association calls off nationwide strike. Prices of petroleum products up by 2.5% at some retail outlets. And in more business tonight, National Insurance Commission to take measures to weed out insurance companies operating illegally and others selling fake policies. Ahead in sports this evening, board chairman of the National Sports Authority, Kojo Ba Ajemine, suspended over Commonwealth Games visa scandal. And on international front, British Prime Minister Theresa May deeply regrets UK's role in criminalizing same-sex relations in its former colonies. got the details of these stories for you here on News 360, including news from the world of entertainment. This bulletin is streaming live all across the world on 3news.com and TV3 Ghana on Facebook. You could also watch us on DSTV channel 279. Absolutely, Natalie. We're going to our first story this evening where former appointees of the Mahama administration accused of taking double salaries are being investigated for stealing. Now, three of them on Tuesday appeared before the Criminal Investigations Department of the Ghana Police Service and had their caution statements taken. Here is Evelyn Temma with some more details on this. MP for Tamale Central, Inusa Fuseini, MP for Ada, Comfort Doyo Gansa, and MP for Isuna for South, Eric Opoku, were at the CID headquarters, having been invited by the Criminal Investigations Department. They were accompanied by their legal team. After minutes of engagement with the police, the MPs said they were being investigated for stealing even though they had not been presented with any evidence for them to substantiate the allegation. I have been uh, interviewed and also asked to write a caution statement. Uh, the what they are investigating me for is stealing and obviously I have not stolen from anybody. MP for Tamale Central and former Minister for Roads and Highways Inusa Fuseni added the police failed to tell them who the complainant is, claiming the move is a calculated attempt to dampen their spirit. I wish to assure our constituents and the Ghanaian public that we will continue to hold government accountable no matter what the consequences will, will be. We have appreciate that these are occupational hazards and we have to go through them. So are you to report back? Well, I'm to report back on the 14th of May at 9 o'clock and I will ensure that I report back. MP4 Ada and former Minister of State at the Presidency in charge of social and allied institutions, Comfort Doyo Gansa, insisted they did not receive double salary. They have good auditors at the finance. If I owe the state, they will even write first to alert you that you owe the state. And if they have not done that, they can do that too on a quiet without our knowledge. A member of the legal team, Victor Kojoga Adawudu, described the allegation as ridiculous and legally without merit. Article 71 is clear. Every MP and a minister who works does not take salary until the committee determines that salary. I would be happy to know, as we speak now, those who are MPs and ministers within the NPP how much is their salary? The president should tell us 
who has determined his salary, the Speaker of Parliament and the leadership should tell us what is the salary. Meanwhile, the minority leader, Haruna Idrisu, speaking off camera, said he has set up a committee to take all the accused MP's bank statements and investigate and report back to him, after which he will respond to it. So there, there is some details emerging on, on this particular story, Natalie. Professor Justice Bali is a head of department at the Public Administration's Health Service Management at the University of Ghana Business School. He joins us on Skype. And I also have uh, Dr. Odro, er, Eric Odrosa. He is uh, also uh, an, a lawyer, a legal practitioner, and also uh, a, a, the a dean of the uh, graduate school of the Institute of Local Government Studies. He joins me on his telephone also for a discussion on this. Doc, I thank you very much for your time uh, this evening. Before I go to Professor Bale, uh, Dr. Dorsai, can you hear me? Good evening to you, sir. Good evening, my brother. Great. Thank you for your time this evening. Now, this is a matter of procedure and law. There are many who have said that at the heart of this matter is a certain lack of communication between the, the, the finance directorate of the presidency at the time of the Mills and Mahama administration and the finance ad, uh, the directorate of parliament at the time. Do, do you agree with, with, with that? Thank you very much. I think it, it, is, it, is, um, it, it is a possibility because when you look at the proposed salary levels and relativities, for 2013 and 2017. If you are a member of parliament, there is a salary scale for you. And then also, if you are a minister of state and also a member of parliament, there is some level of salary that you earn. Now, it is between controller and accountant general's department and the office of parliament. So I think that there is some miscommunication there. But the information we are getting, uh, they, 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 they are very scanty. Let's see how it goes. But the lessons are very clear for us to learn that as soon as a member of parliament is appointed as a minister of state, the office of parliament must be notified, controller and accountant general must be notified, so that at the end of the month, there should be a salary code that can help us to identify that an individual member of parliament has also been appointed as a minister of state, so that if there is any double payment, we will not go about doing this double payment thing. But as I said, um, the information available are very scanty. Let's see how it goes. I want to believe that this, if there is any miscommunication at all, it was not intentional in my view. It is about a system. And if we should be able to put a system in order so that in future some of these things may not occur again. I, I say you make that point about it not being intentional, but <coughs> excuse me, from what we do know, uh, some information we're getting is that there are some instances where some of these persons who have been mentioned gave two different accounts with two different signatures to two different institutions. I mean, that goes beyond the realm of innocence, doesn't it? No, you, you see, if you understand the way public financial management works, if you are a member of parliament, you earn your salary as an MP. As soon as you are appointed as a minister of state, under normal circumstances, they would have to give you a top-up. But then the salary relativity scale also gives you a salary as a minister of state and an MP. So what the system should have done was, once you are an MP and they've given you the MP-based salary, which is about maybe 12000 they give you a top-up of about only 4000 because you are an MP and serve as a minister of state. Someone can decide that this, my top-up, should go into a different account. My basic MP salary should go into another different account. As I said, the evidence is very scanty at this stage. If we go into the merits of the case, if they are able to arrange them before court, I'm sure they will have enough evidence to produce. But we should learn some lessons out of it so that in public sector financial management, we should not allow this to happen again. Because it is sad that we have auditors, internal auditors, we have external auditors. They were not able to uncover this. And it should take a number of years for us to get to this level. It is sad. And I think that auditors must be up and doing in this matter. We're, we're gathering that uh, President Kofuado, I mean, after he uh, appointed his ministers, give them a form. Uh, to feel to actually declare whether they want their emoluments to be paid by the presidency or, or, or by parliament, those who are members of parliament. Professor Justice Bali uh, is with the University of Ghana Business School, uh, specifically the Public Administration's Department. And thank you so much, Prof, for your time this evening on this as well. Now, uh, Dr. Osai makes the point that 
auditors could have detected this problem. A final from you, if the Auditor General's Department and the Controller and Accountant General's Department could have actually prevented this situation from, from happening in the first place. Uh, good evening. I, I'm sorry, but your line broke at some point. So I, I did not get exactly what the question that you put to me was. I, I was asking if the Auditor General's Department and the Controller and Accountant General Department could have played a role to prevent this situation from, from happening. Thank you. Um, I, uh, my view is that this issue is a very complex issue and it points us to a very big problem within our system. Uh, a problem that is not entirely the problem of accountant general and, and even auditor general. It points us to a problem of when or what it is that people are entitled to when they get appointed into public service. One of the things that I have completely been amazed at is the fact that I, when I heard the, the, the accused people talking, I, I was wondering why we do this ourselves so people get appointed and they have no idea, for example, exactly how much they are entitled to and they are being paid on account and they are being paid on account to say that you are getting money and at some point in future we will determine whether or not you got more or less. And if you got more, then it means that you have to refund. If you got less, then it means that we pay you the difference. And I think that is completely unacceptable. And, and that, that's what I say, that this takes us to a bigger problem. So people get into office. So last year, we saw people into office in different capacities. We don't know exactly what, how, what they are entitled to if we know who determined that. We, must we wait to the end of their term as MPs or ministers of state before we are told that this is what they are entitled to? I thought my understanding of the system had been that the, the determination of the emoluments of the, the, the members of parliament and the executive are done in periodic intervals. And that whatever is determined previously is what reigns until a new uh, determination is made. If that is the case, and if that is correct, then mm -hmm. it presupposes that if I were to come into office as minister, whatever it is that the previous minister got, of course, along with some adjustment in salaries of, 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 for, to take care of inflation, and, and annual incremental jams. I get that. And so I know exactly what my salary is. There is no way I would go into an office and continuously work and get paid on account when, in fact, I don't know exactly right. what my salary is. Hmm. Great point, uh, uh, Professor Joseph Bali. I, I don't want to thank you. But uh, finally, with you, uh, uh, Dr. Dossai, if you can hear me. Now, one of them, uh, Comfort Doyo, makes a point that they were even paid their balance. <laughs> and that really means that they thought there was nothing wrong with it. With the criminal investigations initiated, would you support that move uh, to, to get to the bottom of this? Oh, definitely. I'll support that move. Any move that would inject discipline in the financial management system of the, of the country, I'll support it. But we need to get to the bottom of this matter. Let us clean the system. Let us start with a clean bill of health. Let us make sure that we put it behind us. Because we don't have enough resources as a country. We should not allow these resources to go down the drain. So I will support the CID to go into the matter to the bottom so that we get to it and resolve the issue once and for all. We shouldn't be having these discussions again in the next four years. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Eric Odorsai. He's a legal practitioner and also uh, the dean of graduate school and institute of local government studies also uh, joining us on the telephone and on this. And thank you so much as well, Professor Justice Bowley. He is uh, uh, with the University of Ghana Business School Public Administration Department. Grateful for your time this evening on Skype. Natalie. Certainly, Alfred. Pull that in subsequent bulletins. But let's turn to some other stories this evening. The University of Ghana says it is awaiting the outcome of police investigations into the dawn attack at the Mensa Saba Hall to determine the next line of action. Violent clashes on Monday between the students of the Unity Hall of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Kumasi and their counterparts from the Commonwealth Hall of the University of Ghana left one person injured. In what was described as a reprisal attack, the Mensa Saba Hall of the University of Ghana was raided at about 1 a.m. on Tuesday. The glass doors to the hall were smashed, and so was a flat screen television at the hall. The hall porters confirmed the attack but said nothing was stolen. Earlier on Monday, there were clashes between residents of Unity Hall from the University of Science and Technology 
and residents of the Mensa Saba Hall on one hand against residents from the Commonwealth Hall of the University of Ghana. The students from the KNUST were at the University of Ghana to participate in a debate when the violent clashes broke out. The police picked up 10 people but later freed some of them for lack of evidence. One person was also injured in the attack but has since been discharged from the hospital. Public Affairs Director of the University of Ghana, Stella Amoa, says management will wait for the outcome of the police investigation in order to determine the appropriate sanctions for the perpetrators. Uh, just to confirm that this incident took place yesterday, uh, campus security were called in and they moved in to quell the uh, clashes and also received reinforcement from the Ghana police. So I would caution any student who has any intention of continuing with these clashes to be very careful about any acts or violations because they, they will be dealt with. The debate has since been cancelled. Well, the Accra Metropolitan Assembly has demolished Islam at East Ligon here in Accra, popularly called Atemuda. Now, that drinking spot and shops were pulled down after city authorities declared the area a den of criminal activities, including prostitution. Atemuda literally means Judgment Day. The name appears to suggest doom. For the slam noted for criminal activities, an eviction notice by the Accra Metropolitan Assembly gave residents and shop owners up to October 11, 2017, but that directive was clearly ignored. At about midday on Tuesday, a tax force made up of a team of police personnel from the Accra Regional Police Command and Accra Metropolitan Assembly swooped on the community to demolish structures on the stretch. City officials say the exercise has become necessary because the area has become a focal point for prostitutes in the evenings. Uh, please say there are a lot of prostitutes here. Is it true? That one day I don't know because I don't work in the night so I don't know. There is no job so now I don't know what I'm going to do now. Shop owners and attendants hurriedly tried salvaging their goods. Chief Technical Officer of the Ayawasu West Municipal, Augustine Okain, said the assembly had received incessant complaints from residents and had to act. The people in the area have been complaining a lot uh, that the kind of activities going on here is not helping. And then they've threatened uh, even not to pay property rates. Operations commander of the Accra Regional Police Command, Chief Superintendent Kwesifori, says occupants were posing constant risk to residents. Particular area have been rallying point for suspected criminals, prostitution, and what have you. And let us not forget that it is a residential area where families, people, and their children live. And it is not a good example for our society. The AMA and the Accra Regional Police Tax Force have vowed to rid Accra of criminals. You're watching News 360. Let's now take a look at our MTN Vigil reports this evening as Rex Bright Mawunyo Ajakba reports on the destruction and effects caused by tidal waves at Fuvame. Yeah, my name is Bright. I'm speaking from Fuvame, a community in the Keta municipality of Ota region. This community has been under tidal wave destruction and uh, the community is being flooded. All the households are being displayed and they are worried, no place to stay. Remember, you can also send your MTN Vigil report via WhatsApp number 055 That's 055
This is live here on News 360. We've got some more news coming up for you shortly. Stay with us. And welcome back to News 360. Now, President Kofado wants investors in the United Kingdom to consider Ghana as a credible and safe place to invest in as government makes strides in improving the business environment in the country. The President was delivering a keynote address at the second edition of the UK-Ghana Investment Summit on the sidelines of the ongoing Commonwealth meeting in the United Kingdom. President Ikofado assured investors the rule of law in Ghana is not a slogan, but an operating principle of state development. Ghana, the president added, wants to participate in the global marketplace, not on the basis of export of raw materials, but on the basis of its products. We have never wavered in our belief that given an enabling environment, the ingenuity, creativity and sense of enterprise of the Ghanaian will enable us rapidly to develop a strong, powerful economy which will deliver a good, dignified standard of living to our people. President Ikufuado said his government is of the firm conviction that the role of the private sector in the development of the national economy is crucial. The president said his administration in 15 months has put in place measures required to reduce the cost of doing business and improve the business environment in Ghana. The Ghana is a haven of peace, security and stability. A country where the principles of democratic accountability are now firmly entrenched in its body politic. And where the separation of powers is real to promote accountable governance. We are keen on establishing a business friendly economy to attract foreign direct investments, to exploit our country's great potential on mutually satisfactory terms. Investments are protected in fact and in law. The summit organized by the UK Ghana Chamber of Commerce was aimed at improving trade between the two countries. Now, Ghana is seeking support from the UK in the form of urban planning as it makes strides towards its long-term development goals. President Kufuado today met with the Mayor of London as part of efforts to firm up an agreement that will support improvement in both infrastructure and tourism. And basically, we'll be looking at uh, areas of uh, uh, urban planning where the city of London seems to be making some significant strides. And in urban planning, some key thematic areas that we're looking at, it's um, um, infrastructure, uh, tourism, um, uh, environmental sanitation issues, um, as well as the creative arts industry. So these are basic areas that we're looking at in, in, in our relationship. But this involves a lot of money. Uh, is is the, the City of London going to support you in terms of raising funds for this project? Or? Sure, sure. The Mayor of London had made that pledge and uh, we're quite excited about that. But we're here to work out the details. Uh, how soon are we looking at uh, this whole partnership? Well, we're here to work out the details, but it's pretty soon uh, because the Mayor is quite um, you know, anxious to ensure that uh, we strengthen the relationship between our crown and, and the city of London. In fact, admittedly, they have indicated that uh, the London ha hasn't got a um, relationship much with uh, um, African cities, and they believe that uh, um, Accra it's, it's, it's an important city to start with. So that was the mayor of Accra, Mohamed Niyeje Soa there. He's actually part of the president's uh, entourage at that particular uh, meeting of Commonwealth Heads of State. Uh, Pap Kwesi Asari uh, is uh, my colleague in the UK. Uh, he's joined us via Skype now. He has also been attending uh, the UK-Ghana uh, summit there, and he joins me live uh, from the UK. Thank you so much, uh, Pap Kwesi, for your time this evening. Now, you were at the meeting uh, the, the, the president was at with the mayor of London. What exactly is this whole uh, urban planning deal uh, going to take in what form and shape all right uh, alfred so <clears throat> let me first of all state that this whole meeting was facilitated by the uh, ghana uh, uk business awards uh, guba uh, which has been headed by denta now essentially it was a meeting between 
the president of Dankwa Kufuado and the Lord Mayor of London, as well as the Mayor of Accra, Nia J. Soa, who you just had uh, a while ago. And uh, Alfred, as you may be aware, London is one of the most organized cities in the world uh, in terms of railway, transport, uh, infrastructure, tourism, you name it. And this whole idea is to seek a partnership between Ghana and the UK, across, to be specific, and London, uh, to see how London can support Accra in terms of its own infrastructure, uh, tourism, railway, and, and other other areas uh, of support that, 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 you know, London can lend to Ghana. And as you heard me in that clip, uh, I asked the most essential question as to how soon this would be and how much uh, is involved in this whole deal. Uh, he was unable to categorically state how much uh, this would involve, although he, he does admit that it would involve uh, some huge amount of money. He says the UK is willing to support Ghana, but they are yet to work out the fine details of, of all this agreement. So, you know, the president was there uh, in a closed-door meeting with the Lord Mayor of London together with the Accra Mayor, and they discussed uh, this amongst other things. So they just came out briefly to uh, brief the media on exactly what went on. Great for uh, Pakusi for, for this wrap of this. So we're going to be coming to you a lot more in the coming days to get more details of uh, what uh, the, the president and the team has been up to there in the UK. Thank you so much. Pakusi Asari is my colleague in the UK uh, attending the Ghana UK summit there on investment. Up next is business with uh, Nanekia Mensa Brampa. And thanks so much for staying with us. You're still watching News 360, but it's time for us to look at the latest in the world of business. Well, if you're not in good standing and operating as an illegal insurance company, this one is for you because the National Insurance Commission will from next week publish names of insurance companies in good standing. Now, the move according to the commission has become necessary to weed out companies operating illegally and others selling fake policies. Etonam say has more. A few days ago, we had news of some fake insurance company operating in the system somewhere around Swedro in the central region. And it came as a worry because insurance penetration is still below 2% and the NIT has been trying for years to increase penetration. So how many of such fake insurance companies we have in the system deepening the walls of insurance penetration here in Ghana? Here with me is the Commissioner General of the National Insurance Commission, Justice Ofuri himself, to tell us what he makes of this whole news. Yes, um, Etonam, we are really worried because it affects the uh, insurance penetration in Ghana. We see this as a very big leakage in our system, and uh, we're doing all we can to actually deal with this situation. Tell us about what you're doing to deal with the situation. How many of such insurance companies do we have in the system? There are concerns that we need their names published. Yeah, um, beginning um, next week, we're going to have um, the list of all insurance companies in good standing with the commission, as well as brokers in good standing, so that the public would be aware of whoever they do business with. Um, I cannot be very specific with the numbers, but I believe that about 30% of the insurances on the market are fake. There are growing concerns over insurance contribution of less than 2% to the country's GDP. Many experts have therefore called for a greater collaboration between stakeholders to grow the sector. But with fake insurance companies currently operating in the country, there's a greater worry that the insurance penetration could drop further. When we find them, we get them arrested. As we speak about three weeks ago, with the support of the um, police command in Central Region, we were able to apprehend one uh, company, Suitel Insurance Company in Swedro. Commissioner of the National Insurance Commission, Justice Ofori, says the NIC is instituting measures to detect fake insurance policies. We believe that if someone is traveling to his hometown and he has to go board a public transit, he has the option of just keying the, uh, the, the license plate number of the vehicle and instantly on his phone and uh, to a short code and this person should instantly get uh, um, a verification as to whether the vehicle he's going to board has a valid insurance before even buying the ticket. In effect, 
The NIC has eight months to institute this database system to detect fraudulent insurance companies. Etonamse, TV3. And not so much good news going for vehicle owners as well as consumers in general. This is because prices of petroleum products have gone up by some 2.5 percentage points there at some filling stations across the country. Now, the new prices follow a release of the second pricing window for April by the Institute of Energy Security, which predicted a 2.3 percent increment. Our checks at various pumps revealed that customers have to pay an increment of at least two pesos per liter for various products at the pump. At the Nima Goel filling station, the price of super, which was four Ghana cities, 51 pesos per liter, is now four Ghana cities, 55 pesos per liter. Diesel was four Ghana cities, 49 pesos per liter. And it's now four Ghana cities, 54 pesos per liter. Better the change since 11th of this month. We understand what is going on in the system, the downstream system, about the rural growth. When the prices go down, the OMCs will reduce it. And it goes up. Managers at some branches of Total and Glory Oil, who spoke off camera, said prices at their pumps remain the same since they are yet to receive any directive from their head office. Uh, we heard it from the, listen, uh, from the news. That there have been a two and a half percent increment. And we had a two percent last week. The government promised to uh, reduce this thing drastically. And look at what we are seeing. So we are fed up of, with all those things. Yeah, I've noticed, but I was thinking maybe I got cheated by the guy who um, filled my tank. Because the usual gauge I used to get when I buy a particular amount, I didn't get that. So I, I wasn't sure, but I don't know anything about that, if they've changed it or not. And on to the March talk about minimal capital requirements. Well, some banks seem ready, and Zenith Bank is one of them. Through retained earnings, they have raised the 400 million cities' new minimum capital requirements set by the central bank. Commission, commercial banks have also, up to the end of December this year, to recapitalize. Now, those unable to meet the deadline will face a possible loss of their banking license. The new minimum capital requirement is a 233% increment over the old 120 million cities benchmark. Various options to capitalize a bank include measures, acquisitions, takeovers, listing on a stock exchange, and dependence on the bank's reserves, including income surplus. Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of Zenith Bank Ghana, Henry Oro, attributed the bank's recapitalization drive to long-term strategic interest management backed by the shareholders of the bank. Our capital has been increased to about 400 million Ghana City, I think giving us some quite substantial figures in our return earnings. From inception, the shareholders uh, operated a dividend policy where 100% of our earnings were retained in the business. And that kind of policy gave us a lot of size balance sheet to play in the market to support government and support the private sector in the developmental agenda of Ghana. He noted the hard work of management and staff and customers' confidence were key in the success story of the bank. Henry Oro pledged the bank's continued support towards the local economy. The SME is key for this market, an industry where if we need to grow this market, grow this economy, every bank has to focus on that. Uh, in the manufacturing sector, the corporate sector, um, and of course the corporate sector, usually their appetite are much larger. We look corporate with the multinationals who will be able to who have the higher tickets and the big tickets on the energy debt sitting on the books of some banks, the MD and CEO noted it was not affecting the operations and profitability of Zenith Bank. Those figures are figures that are also attributable to government and um, there are discussions with the government as to see how those things will be cleared as soon as possible. And if they, even if they are not, for us the figures are so minimal that we probably may not notice them in our financials. 
In September last year, Zenith Bank indicated that it was willing to engage any commercial bank struggling to meet the new capital levels for possible acquisition. Henry Oro says the option is still open, though no bank has approached yet. Well, meanwhile, the head of banking supervision department of the Bank of Ghana, Osei Jesse, has dismissed suggestions that the recent action by the central bank to sanitize the banking industry as harsh. She indicated the regulator is performing its duties to protect the industry, especially customers who could lose their investment in the event of insolvency. The head of banking supervision of the central bank noted the need for a robust banking industry, one that makes investments safe, hence the new minimum capital requirement of 400 million CDs. If a bank doesn't have enough capital, what it means is that depositors' funds are going to be used to acquire fixed assets. Depositors' funds, which the banks have taken will be used to grant long-term loans. And if these funds were deposited for a very short period, what it means is that depositors will be exposed to risk because when they need their money, the monies will not be available. They have been caused by the local banks for the central bank to extend the deadline of the minimum capital requirement from December 31 this year to December 31, 2022. However, the central bank disagrees. We all agreed that 400 million Ghana cities is what is required for all banks in this country to enable them play their rules effectively. As far as Bank of Ghana is concerned, our position has not changed. The deadline for meeting the minimum paid up capital of 400 million is 31st December 2018. Having more capital helps banks better absorb adverse shocks and thus reduces the probability of financial distress. A strong banking sector boosts economic growth, attracts foreign direct investment and increases business confidence. All right, so you can visit 3news.com for more on the business segment. But that will do for tonight. My name is Nanikia Mesa Bamba. There's more on News 360. Good evening. Hi, good evening, and it's time for us to bring you all the latest from the world of sports right here on News 360. My name is Thierry Nyan, and we are starting off, uh, you know, with a visa scandal that has engulfed the Ghanaian sporting scene that has uh, claimed, of course, its latest victim after the government suspended the board chairman of the National Sports Authority, Kojo Bajuman. A statement from the office of the president said the suspension has uh, been issued after preliminary investigations into how about 60 Ghanaians secured visas and were detained in the attempt to enter Australia. Bajiman is a third high-profile official to be suspended by Nana Ekufuado following the visa scandal that wrecked Ghana's uh, you know, Commonwealth Games campaign. The chief executive of the National Sports Authority, Robert Safo, and the deputy youth and sports minister, Payos Hajide, have already been suspended following preliminary investigations. All right, so we go straight to the Ghana Premier League. Of course, Ghana football uh, is uh, definitely rising yet again. And of course, it's another going to be, it's going to be another round of fixtures in this particular midweek. Round eight, it is. Asante Kotoko are going to be looking to come back from their inconsistent, uh, you know, campaign so far alongside Accra Hatsufoka. I'll be telling you about the phobians shortly. But uh, Kotoko, they begin this particular round of fixtures against Brekum Chelsea. And that game will be at the Babayara Stadium. Bichem United will also come up against Wa All Stars and then Omina Sharks. Remember, they beat Hearts of Folk, uh, you know, by two goals to one in the previous round. They'll be facing Mediema Sporting Club, who also won their game or have won, uh, you know, their last couple of games in the GPL this season. Now, Inter Allies, they have a stellar home record. They keep scoring without conceding. Maybe Kenichi Yatsuhashi has something under his sleeve 
uh, alongside his players as they welcome 11 Wonders. Carolina United will be welcoming uh, Hearts of Folk to the West and hopefully they'll be able to get a result against the uh, Hearts of Folk side who, remember, are going to be without their head coach, Henry Wellington. Wafa will be at home. Remember, they lost their last home game to Mediama Sporting Club. Before then, they had gone on a 46 game on beating Ran in Sugakope. Maybe they'll be able to rekindle that, uh, that kind of home form against the league leaders, Ashanti Gold, who also, uh, by different standards, are playing some very, very good football this season. Liberty Professionals will be at the Karindorf Park against Dreams FC, which will be a very, very good one, just because of the sides involved. Uh, two sides promising lots of entertainment. Ediana Stars and their game against the Bissau Dwarves has been postponed. Remember, Ediana Stars have uh, it all to do in the CAF Confederations Cup as they hope to uh, earn some promotion into or progress into the group stages. But uh, let's still focus on the Ghana Premier League and it's match day eight in the GPL. Asante Kotoko and Akra Hato Folk have still not found their way to the top and do not look convincing either. Wafa are struggling after a run of four games without a win and Liberty Professionals have blown extremely hot and cold this season. It is all in this preview for match day eight by Alfo Sulabi. All right, so we'll bring you that particular uh, story shortly right here on this uh, you know, channel. But let, let's move on from here. Let's go straight to Indiana Stars. Remember, they have uh, moved all the way to Madagascar. And Ghana's sole representative in the CAF Confederations Cup, Indiana Stars, um, uh, their first are chasing their first ever away win in the CAF Inter-Club match on Wednesday when they take on Fosa Juniors and ultimately their first group stage appearance. The Ghana League champions have left the shores of the country in their uh, return league game uh, against uh, you know, Fosa Juniors. I'm talking about the CAF Confederations Cup. Now the Fire Boys will be heading into the uh, you know, game with a huge 6-1 advantage having thrashed their counterparts in the first leg uh, match played at Anna Ajiman Bedu Park. Ediana were one of the 16 clubs demoted from the CAF Champions League after failing to make it into the group stage as they lost against ES Atif. So to that story I was talking about, about previewing into Kumasi Asante Kotoko Wafa and Accra Hearts of Folk. Let's take a look at the preview story. Things are plummeting at Kumasiya Santikotoko. The club is losing its fear factor and they haven't looked anything like themselves this season. Sunday's loss marked an eighth consecutive away loss in the league, a run they have not witnessed in over five years. They aren't scoring many goals either, just five this season, and have relied on penalties at home to compensate for their inefficiency in front of goal. Against Brickham Chelsea on March Day 8, the Porcupine Warriors will be looking to maintain their 100% home record. Given how bad Chelsea have been on the road, Fabian and his charges can have a smile. Things aren't improving at Hearts of Oak either. They cannot create any meaningful atmosphere at the Cape Coast Stadium. The defeat to Adriana Stars rocked them and now the news about their team being without head coach Henry Wellington will rock them even harder. Only a great performance at Anyanase when they take on Karela can make things better. A club that needs to be better at all costs now is the West African Football Academy. Their struggles have been down to how unusual their home form has been. The last time they won a game was on March Day 3 when they beat Adriana Stars at home. They faced Ashgold on Wednesday at home and they can only use that as grounds to lay down the marker and halt a painful slide. In other games, Sharks On that note, we'll bring an end to the sports bulletin right here on News 360. We'll bring you some more sports news uh, later on Sports Unlimited at 10.30. Just keep watching TV3. We're here for you. So good evening, it's now time for some entertainment and lifestyle news brought to you by Vodafone Power to you and Fan Max Fuel Your Day. My name is Nana Quadrado and we're moving on just after the uh, Vodafone Ghana Music Awards as celebrated rapper Sakodie is embarking on a
campaign to get roads connecting major cities dualized. The hitmaker who survived a road accident a fortnight ago is convinced uh, linking cities with dual carriage roads will help curb accidents and associated fatalities. Usu Arai has more. If you think about safety, that is way safer. And we did a few checks with uh, the Road Safety Commission. What he said is if you have the double lanes, the worst that can happen is you might go into a gutter. You can be safe with that. Uh, with the Boji, the Mahogoni banner is the head on. Per the nature of their work, musicians are always on the move, exposing them to accidents. Many breadwinners and celebrated entertainers have lost their lives through avoidable road crashes. Sarkodie believes the time to promote road safety is now. Motivated by the rapper's recent accident on the Kumasi Agogo Road, the advocacy for the construction of dual carriage roads to link major cities is expected to curb head-on collisions. As of now, if we don't have double roads leading to all these cities, it might not happen now, but we need to start the conversation. What we came up with is having the double roads to every city. The is that MACA, if you think about it, the same thing. See, the moment there's a curve and you don't know who is coming, now will be a farm open. That's it. it. This is seriously a wake up call. Music Up President Bice Osekufo outlined the core objectives of the campaign. The first thing is to get our roads dualized, our intercity roads. Let's have dual carriageways to connect all our regional capitals. We know it's expensive, but Ghana can do it. We found money to do so many other things. Why can't we find money to do this? Because it is important. Aside that, empowering the Road Safety Commission and giving the right resource to the Motor Traffic Department of the Police Service, we feel strongly that is one of the clearest ways that we can reduce the fatalities that are associated with road accidents. The union has adopted road safety as its main agenda for the next two years. We have made a passionate appeal to musicians. For the next two years, our core campaign is road safety. Team Sark and the leadership of Musica are expected to soon meet the president to discuss the possibility of having dual carriage roads to connect cities. So from now on you see obviously um, a push on social media. From there we are meeting the people in charge. We've met the Road Safety Commission. We're, we're moving as far as going to see the president as well. So we still stay with Sarkodie as uh, he debunks claims that he faked the recent accident, noting such thoughts are laughable. Uh, the wake-up call uh, composer revealed he still gets flashbacks weeks after surviving the head-on collision. So I did not necessarily feed into it because um, I told my team how we were supposed to deal with it. I don't think it's necessary, you know, going on social media, trying to tell people, looking for sympathy. You know, I dealt with it with family, with my team, with Dean, so we did not involve a lot of energies into it. Till now, I keep getting flashbacks. It was that serious. Actually, people thought I was lying about the accident, trying to push the campaign, which is funny. Why would I go into a bush and come out just to act it, you know? Um, it, was, it, was, it was serious. It was um, a head-on collision accident. Looking back at what happened, I thank God for my life that I'm, I'm still here. So we thank God for the life of Michael Owusuado Sarkodie. But moving on to other stories, relationship expert Councillor Lutrud has sided with Shata Wale for allegedly beating his girlfriend Shata Michi. In a chat with uh, Kofi TV, the self-acclaimed councillor said Shata Michi deserves to be beaten, arguing she's, she's wrong to stay under the same roof with a man she's not married to. If their social media posts are anything to go by, then Shatawale and his baby mama's relationship is facing difficult moments. Shatawale in a Facebook post accused Shatamichi of threatening him with a knife and also slapping him in front of her mother. Shatamichi, on the other hand, posted a photo revealing the injuries she suffered after Shatawale abused her. But in all this, some Ghanaians have described the fight a fake gimmick. So that's about it for entertainment news this evening. My name is Nana Quadrado, brought to you by Vodafone Power to you and Fanmax for all your day. We'll be right back with more.
Welcome back. Now, British Prime Minister Theresa May has said she deeply regrets the UK's role in criminalizing same-sex relations in its former colonies. British rule and are still used in 37 of the Commonwealth 53 member nations. At a Commonwealth meeting, Mrs. May said laws were wrong then and wrong now. There's a global trend toward discriminalizing homosexual acts, but some countries like Nigeria and Uganda have imposed stricter laws, according to the International Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Trans and Intersex Association. Same-sex relations are explicitly banned in 72 countries. The number of states that criminalize same-sex relations is decreasing annually, with Belize and the Seychelles repealing such laws in 2016. However, in many socially conservative and religious countries in Africa where homosexuality is a taboo, there has been resistance from calls to calls to decriminalize same-sex relationships. South Africa which rejoined the Commonwealth after the end of white minority rule in 1994, is one of the exceptions. And you can get some more international news on our website. It's 3news.com. And that's how we round up News 360 this evening. Thanks so much for watching. We've got some more news on our website. News at 10 old simulcast on our sister station. It's 3FM 92.7. I'm Natalie Ford. And my name is Alfred Okansing. Good evening.